We're in a series in the book of Hebrews. It's an interesting book because it was written to people who were steeped in Jewish tradition and Jewish teaching. So you'll notice when we read through, there's going to be some quotes that feel a little bit disjointed. The author knew that when he wrote to these new believers who had been raised in these traditions, they understood where the quotes were from and the context of them. When we read it, it feels a little bit disjointed. But what we'll do today is kind of make a connection of that context so that we understand this passage a little bit better. It tells us in Hebrews, it says chapter 3, it's actually chapter 4. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed enter that rest just as God has said. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. That's a reference to Psalm 95. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. So he's noticing a tension between two different places in Scripture. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts, the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. When our children were little, my wife's parents lived in Florida, and so uh, we would go down twice a year to visit her parents. And uh, our practice was is that we would uh, start our trip to Florida from Jamestown, New York, at 10 o'clock on Sunday evening. And uh, our church in Jamestown had a Sunday morning service and a Sunday evening service, and I was responsible for speaking in the Sunday evening service. And so we would have that service, we would go home, I would get a shower, we would pack up the van, and we would head out and drive 21 hours straight. See? <laughs> yeah. and. Um, and so we would drive. What we discovered is, is that for the kids, if they slept all night, it actually felt like a shorter trip to them. If we drove all day and then stopped at a hotel and then drove all day, it was really difficult. So we decided to do this. But whenever we would stop at a rest stop, I would get out and I would play a game of tag with the kids. And so uh, it would just kind of burn up a little of their energy. And so they actually looked forward to the rest stops. And, and they, they would see one when we drive by it, and they would see that as a missed opportunity. Now, if, if you are an adult, what you realize is, is that as an adult, we don't see rest stops as fun. We see rest stops as a waste of time. We're, we're, I could be there earlier, and now I'm going to be there later because we stopped. I've got a friend. We've traveled with them. And when his kids would say, we need a bathroom break, he would not believe them until they were crying yellow tears. And then he would pull over. It was a waste of time. Simple truth is, is that when it comes to rest, we often see rest as a waste of time. But the, the reality is, is that just as surely as we need air in order to live, just as surely as we need water and food, we also need rest. And if we don't get it, life doesn't work. 
And there's different kinds of rest. There certainly is the physical rest, but there's a lot more than that. And this passage begins to unpack quite a bit of that information. So this author is once again referring to people, and he's making reference to some Old Testament passages of Scripture because he knew that they would understand the context. And he starts off with this idea that a lack of rest can be considered a form of punishment. He refers back to a story that has to do with the exodus of God's people from the land of bondage, which was Egypt, into the land of promise. It took a lot longer than God desired for that to happen. And uh, it also refers back to the part that there came a point when they were at the border of the land of promise and God encouraged them. He called them to go in and they just refused to do it. And as a result, they never entered into the rest that God intended for them. That was a place of economic rest where they would be able to have more than enough for their family. It was a place of social rest because there was a civil and just government. And, the, and the, uh, the, that region of the world, if, if you saw what the cultures were like, it, even today people would rise up and say someone needs to do something about that. Just the unbelievable uh, cases of human trafficking, uh, preying upon those who are the most vulnerable in society. It was unbelievable how bad it was. And so just called for the opportunity to go in. And they just were afraid. They didn't think they could manage it. And so the Bible says that God considered, he, he says this, you, you will never enter in. And it sounds like punishment. And in a way it is. That just think about this. That not being able to rest is a form of punishment. Uh, in places where they want to extract intelligence from captives, they often do not allow them to sleep. Remember, this group of people had been slaves for over 400 years. You know, there weren't any 400-year-old slaves in the group, but multi-generations, they had been slaves. And one thing about a slave is, you don't get a day off. It's not like working the jobs that we work. There were no days off. When the sun came up, you got up. And you did whatever you were instructed until someone told you you were done for the day. And then you would get up the next day and you would do it all over again. And what God is telling them is that when you live like that, when there is no rest in your life, what you're really doing is you're living exactly like a slave lives. So who are the slave drivers? And this begins to be a really intense conversation for our culture. Because the simple truth is, is that inside of us there can be a sense of restlessness. You, I'm sure you know what it's like when you have the opportunity to relax and you're not able to do it, right? Everything's, you don't have anything pressing. You can just kind of sit back, but somehow internally all the engines are still running and revving at a real high revolution. So what, what is this internal tension that we experience? And it can be regret, just something that we did, we, if we could go back in time, if I could undo that, I would do it. Or it could be, if I could go back in time, I would do something I didn't do. You know, I would speak up, I would say something. That just revs our internal engines. Or rejection, the fear that someone is going to create distance with us. And we can't enjoy a moment even with them because we're so afraid they're going to push us away. Disapproval, somehow we won't meet someone's standards. Worry. Worry about what is going to happen or what might not happen. Insecurity, the fear that I'm just not good enough. and Someone's going to find it out. And then I'm going to be undone. Is, has anybody ever heard of FOMO? F-O-M-O. Fear of missing out. There are people who wear themselves to a frazzle trying to show up for everything because they don't want to miss a good thing. And they're just exhausted. Dissatisfaction. Working for what we do not have, hoping we can get it. Or worse yet, working for something we do not want. Happens all the time. Pretending to be someone we're not. Disengagement. Withholding our potential best. Because we don't think it's the right time. And all of these things and more just act like an engine that races inside of us. And even when we have the opportunity for quiet... We're not at rest. And this, this internal thing, it's not just a feeling. It actually starts driving some of our thoughts and our decisions and our actions. 
Uh, I actually think, and there's a lot of science to support this in, in, in psychology, that a lot of our impulsive actions and a lot of our addictive behaviors are connected to our sense of unrest inside that we're trying to find a way to, to quiet that inner voice that seems to be constantly telling us something is wrong, something is not right, you're not there yet, you gotta try harder, you gotta do more. And we have to find a way to try to shut that voice down. That's why this point is so important. It's not possible to live a balanced life if we don't know how to rest. It's not possible. So the author of Hebrews refers to this generation that came after them, and they actually went into the promised land, and they experienced civil rest, and they experienced social rest, and they experienced economic rest. All of those things were beneficial to them. But he says, even in the passage we looked at, there was still a rest that they were missing. So he actually refers to that in verse 7. In verse 8, Joshua had led the children of Israel into the land of promise, that, that next generation worked up the courage and they walked into the place that God wanted them to. And they weren't slaves. And they experienced the benefits of a land that was incredibly productive. I mean, even to this day, if you go to Israel, you will see tractor trailer after tractor trailer after tractor trailer and a an seemingly unending line of fruit and produce and vegetables that just get shipped out of that nation. It's unbelievable how productive that is. And, and they needed a spiritual, but they needed a spiritual rest. They had economic rest, they had social rest, but they needed a spiritual rest. And that's what they were missing. So our culture also struggles with this kind of thing. Excuse me, just a second. This would be a good opportunity to remind you to silence your cell phones. <laughs> okay. Where was I? Silence in I, I, I need a rest. <laughs> Who calls a pastor in the middle of a message? If it was one of you, I'll know. I've got caller ID. So our culture struggles with this. And until we learn how to rest, we're going to live like slaves. We will not stop. We'll just keep going to try to prove something to somebody, if not ourselves, to find or obtain the thing that we think will finally make us worthy or proved or loved. And God says, it's a horrible way to live. We always have this sense, I didn't quite get enough, I'm not quite good enough. And then there's this, it, it seems like it's disconnected, but it's actually quite connected. When we're reading through this passage about this lack of rest, there's a reference to God's word. And this is what it's telling us, God's word reveals it all. It gives quite an alarming picture. You know, for those of us who've kind of been raised in church, we stop being alarmed at some of the messages in Scripture. But this is quite an alarming one. He says, God's word is like a sword, like a double-edged sword. And so it's incredibly sharp. In fact, it says it pierces and it severs, and it doesn't just reveal actions. It actually discloses and exposes motives, attitudes. There are lots of people who don't like Scripture just because of that. Because it starts uncovering stuff and it makes them uncomfortable. And we think if we can stay away from the uncomfortable stuff, it won't bother us anymore. But actually, that's not how it works. So we have to be, able to, to be able to embrace the wisdom that comes in God's Word. Now, I know there's some people who go, I don't need the moral codes of Scripture. I'll build my own. And by the way, you have. We all have. Imagine if we had created the technology that allowed us to go back through your life and recover every single word you've ever spoken. You're getting anxious already, aren't you? <laughs> and let's suppose that we could filter that, that technology to the point where we just only could hear the statements where you said, they should have, or they should not have, or I would have, or I would never. Let's just discover those statements and line them up and read them. And what you will discover is you have created your own moral code and more terrifying than that, not one of us have lived up to it. Yeah. 
the problem is not the, that there's no code. The problem is we can't live up to any of the codes. And that's why we're not at rest. And then he tells us this. Not only is there the problem of Scripture reveals it all, but he says God sees it all. He sees every single thing. Nothing is hidden from him. This is what, nothing is, or everything is uncovered and laid bare before him. This is a reference back to Genesis. And it's the story of Adam and Eve, who when God created them, he did not create them with fashion. He just created Adam and Eve. So they walked around without any clothes. And the Bible says about them that they were naked and they were not ashamed. They were in no ways embarrassed. Now, I know that about 15% of the population in Western culture has an occasional dream where they are naked in public. And that's, that's a problem. You don't think so? <laughs> I'm pretty sure it is. It, it's a problem. And their, their fear, and there's all kinds of psychologies to why a person might have that dream, but this is what's true. Adam and Eve were completely unashamed and unembarrassed until they partook of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. And the moment they did that, all of a sudden they became incredibly self-conscious. And their first action was to find leaves and find a way to, to, to bind them together so they could try to cover up. And when God asked them what happened, the first thing they did was blame Hiding and covering up, blaming and accusing. These are the natural responses of people who are no longer at rest. And everybody does it. We're so worried someone's going to see everything there is to see about us, and then they won't love us, then they won't approve of us, then they will actually distance themselves from us. And this becomes a driving fear in our lives, and it, it impacts so many of the ways that we live. So they acted in disobedience, and now they're just covering up and they're blaming. They're, it, it creates this horrible tension in their life. They're afraid to be known, but they crave a relationship where they are known. It's unbelievable. They're afraid to be rejected, but they engage in behavior by blaming that actually causes rejection. This is what unrest does in our lives. And God sees it all, which doesn't make us feel any better. He sees all of our actions, but it says not just our actions. He sees all of our motives, all the attitudes of our hearts. He sees everything. So our response to God is just like it is to other people. We try to hide and we try to blame. I had a friend one time who, who this is what he told me, whether he believes it or not, I don't know. But he told me that he had a hat that if he put it on, God couldn't see his thoughts. So I don't think it works that way. So what are we supposed to do? Scripture reveals it all. God sees it all. And we're all caught in this state of unrest. What are we supposed to do? And believing the gospel is the source of our rest. Believing the gospel is the source of our rest. Verse 3 reveals that to us. That when people heard the good news and they believed it, they entered into that rest. There, there's, there is a work that has been completed. That's why God rests in, in, in the book of Genesis. All the work is done. And so he can rest. Here's what we need to know. That work of rest, we are incapable of completing it ourselves. We're always working, always striving, always trying, assuming if I can obtain this, or that, or this person, then I will finally prove to the world that I'm worthy. And what God's word says is it's not how it works. You can keep trying to be approved. You can keep trying to find meaning. You can keep trying to feel secure, and it doesn't work. So what does God do? He sends his son. Jesus came into our world, and one of the first things he shows us is what it's like to live a life where you're not hiding and you're not blaming. And, I mean, even people who don't believe in Jesus are incredibly impressed by the way he spoke and how he treated other people. Because it's not how people work in our world. How did he manage that? And it's because he completely trusted his father. 
And because of that, he was able to live in an unhidden way and an unaccusatory way. And so then the point comes where our world doesn't react very well to that. And so they actually put him on a cross and they beat the life out of him. And this is what's interesting. God in the flesh is actually stripped naked and laid bare for all of us. And he was beaten until there is no life left. And, and just before he gives up his last breath, this is what he says. He utters these words, it is finished. He did not say, I quit. He did not say, I give up. He said, it is finished. He wasn't tapping out. He was telling us the work of our redemption is complete. And now God can rest. And those who believe it, can also rest. We can rest from our work. The work of God redeeming humanity was completed at the cross. There's nothing left to be done other than just you believing it. And when you believe it, you start to experience rest. And that's what we so desperately need. So when can this happen? It's in the passage we read today. It's not something you work for. The work has been done. It's not something you earn. It's already been provided. It's not something you prove. God did it for us. And all you have to do is believe. Let's bow our heads this morning. We can put ourselves on a treadmill that just never seems to stop. And we always wonder if we're good enough. Our world has uh, provided lots of options to try to quiet that voice. We've got mind-altering substances of every kind. We, we have a thing called comfort food. We eat it not because it's good for us, but because it tastes good and makes us feel better. Alcohol flows like streams, and, and it seems like we can never get enough to quiet that voice. We can try to distract ourselves and binge watch, binge watch stuff and spend all of our time online. I actually think that there are lots of people who they seem to have an addiction to pornography and it's actually not born out of a sexual attraction. It's born out of this, this constant, non-stopping voice inside of them that tells them they'll never be good enough for the real thing. And God comes into our world with all of our striving and all of our exhaustion and everything that is driving us into the dust from which we were created. And God says, there is a better way, and I will do the work for you. And it's absolutely amazing that the moment you start believing that, something internally starts to change. I'm not asking you just to be a more religious person. Some of the most restless people in the world are religious. I'm asking you to trust what God said he did. And then just watch what begins to happen on the inside of you. It completely changes everything. And now, when you get that moment to rest or relax, instead of your mind haunting and taunting you and reminding you of all the things you haven't done or should do, you can actually enjoy the incredible blessings that God has poured into your life. That's what he wants for you. Be done with your striving. Set aside your restless ways. Dare to believe that when Jesus said it is finished, the work was done. And all you have to do is believe it. Father, help us today. This is something that's hard for us. We're hardwired to be restless. Would you help all of us who are exhausted and fatigued come to you today and find rest for our souls?
In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand this morning.